They are killers, they are murderers. Richard Madd and David Sweat tunneled out of their cells to escape. A prison break that would captivate the entire country. This is the first escape from the maximum security portion of this facility. It was elaborate, it was sophisticated. Are you allowed to put your Then if you saw it as a movie script, it would have been unbelievable, frankly. We have this uh, civilian Taylor working in the prison and she is corrupted by these prisoners. And put New York's North Country on edge. Well, nobody wants crazed escape killers running around on the streets. It can be tough just looking for, say, a lost hiker and trying to look for two individuals who do not want to be found. It, it was very difficult. Where did they go? And in the initial stages, honestly, it's, uh, you know, it's like chasing a ghost. One minute we think they're still here in Denimore, the next minute we think they're in Willsboro. Area of Franklin County, New York. And how far would they be willing to go? Presume that they're armed and dangerous. To make sure they never went back to prison. And there's no question in their minds, any place else but here. You know, there's a reason they call it Little Siberia. It's a horrible experience. More than three weeks and thousands of tips lead to two violent confrontations. A long run for Richard Matt, the escaped murderer, ended Friday. Breaking news, David Sweat taken into custody. And now one big investigation to find out what went wrong. We have two people who have been arrested, but the investigation's not over. And certainly the interest in this story is not over either. I'm Solomon Side, and thank you for joining us here on Time Warner Cable News. Over the next half hour, we're going to take you outside the wall and go inside the Danamora prison break. You're going to hear from the people who knew firsthand Richard Matt and David Sweat's history of violence and the leaders who helped recapture these two dangerous fugitives. But to get inside their criminal minds, first you need to peek inside the place they so badly wanted out of, Clinton Correctional Facility. Dana Moore, nestled in the Adirondacks, it's as quaint as it is quiet. Less than 5,000 residents call this once proud mining town home. So proud, in fact, it was named after Danamore, Sweden, an iron mining region in that Scandinavian country. But the idea for its most infamous inhabitant came from just 140 miles away, give or take, in Saratoga Springs, New York. Ransom Cook is probably one of the lesser known um, important figures in Saratoga Springs history. Oh, but not in Danamora, where the roadway bearing his name runs right alongside the Clinton Correctional Facility. He was asked um, uh, by the governor to try to locate um, a place in northern New York where they could build a large prison um, that actually had um, ore and other materials nearby that they could use for the construction of it. Cook, the former justice of the peace in Saratoga County, not only built Clinton Correctional in 1845, he became its first warden. It was known to be very, um, have some very um, liberal and, um, say, uh, kind uh, practices as a warden. Something that people don't understand is that inmates do a lot of the work in there. Brian Mann is the Adirondack Bureau Chief for North Country Public Radio. He's reported inside the walls at Danamora several times and still maintains a network of sources who've both worked and done hard time here. And that so-called liberal tradition started by Cook continues. Inmates are uh, assigned to the maintenance crews. Inmates do a lot of the cleaning. Inmates help with a, a huge array of cooking and, and other tasks. This freedom, relatively speaking, extends to what's known as the North Yard. It's really quite dramatic. They call them the courts. And inside that area, inmates are given their own little bit of turf, their own little real estate that they can control. But control sometimes comes with consequences. Inmates have a lot of ability to communicate, to share information. Uh, one inmate picks up one clue about how the prison works, they pass it to another inmate. Inmates sharing information? Well, seems harmless enough in a prison patrolled by hundreds of corrections officers. But New York State Governor Andrew Cuomo says that is forgetting one key factor. If you are a problem inmate in the other facilities, the threat is, I will send you to Danamora. There's a reason they call it Little Siberia. It's not a great place to be. When these men and women go to work there, 
They're locked inside, whether it's eight hours or 16 hours, with violent criminals. One of those criminals was Eric Jensen, who did a little less than a year in Dannemora for possession of stolen property. You know, you, you take it one day at a time in there because you never know if you're gonna make it to that date. A lot of the people who are in there are very bad people. Um, these are people you don't want getting out. And perhaps none fit that description better than the two men Eric Jensen met in the prison tailor shop. He was always a thinker, always a very intricate planner. He was David Sweat. You would think you were talking to somebody that was going to college or somebody that was, uh, you know, maybe, maybe even a lawyer. Only David Sweat broke the law in one of the most violent ways possible. Mr. Sweat and his accomplices hit the sheriff's deputy with the car, got out and shot him 22 times, and then ran over him. It's very hard driving by here, seeing it all the time, and knowing what happened to him. Stephen Tarcia will never forget the day his brother Kevin, a Broome County Sheriff's deputy, was killed in that hail of gunfire back in 2002. He lost his best friend. I know he did wrong as well as he does, even though he was 21 when he did it. And Pamela Sweat lost her son to a sentence of life without parole in Clinton Correctional, though she believes she started to lose him long before that when he was just nine years old. He took his baseball and threw it through the window hoping it would hit his dad, and because it didn't, he broke his new TV that he just got him for his birthday. A history of violence. Retired North Tonawanda Chief of Detectives Gabriel DiBernardo knows a thing or two about that. He had a run-in with the other man Eric Jensen met in Clinton Correctional's tailor shop, Richard Mack. Considering the most cunning, evil, sadistic person I ever investigated in 38 years. Matt was in Dannemora for 25 to life for killing his former boss, William Rickerson, former because he fired him. So he actually ended up assaulting him, beating him, torturing him for 24 hours for, for $20. Yes, he was a man of violence, and he would follow up his violence. And if he said that he was going to get you, yes, you, you better be fearful. But Richard Matt had other ways of getting what he wanted. Well, he was six feet tall, very muscular, and he knew how to handle himself. He's a charmer, of course. He's always been a ladies' man. And that all brings us back to Dana Mora and back to that tailor shop. But there was a, apparently, on her part at least, a genuine emotional connection. Joyce Mitchell was the prison seamstress. She taught the inmates how to sew, stitch together uniforms for COs and bus drivers. But Eric Jensen says she was eager to help in other ways too, especially when it came to Matt and Sweat. I, I, I believe that's what, what it was. She was drawn to the attention that she got from, from David and Rich. But that wasn't the only perk. Despite their heinous crimes, Matt and Sweat found themselves in the honor block, a section of Clinton Correctional Reserve for well-behaved inmates. It's alleged that this one group of uh, employees kept moving that line back and back and back until they went too far. Richard, Matt, and David Sweat are getting favors and gathering info. Question is, what would they do with it? As soon as I saw the cell and the cut out in the back of the cell. It literally reminded me of the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. Authorities left scrambling when outside the wall, going inside the Dannemora prison break continues. While in that tailor shop, you know, she, she, she did things for the, the group as a whole as well, not just uh, personally, she used to bring in like little things like donuts. Prison seamstress Joyce Mitchell is doing more than just teaching convicts how to sew. That according to former inmate Eric Jensen. She's giving them food and maybe something else. Inmates and staff work in this very collaborative way like you would with your foreman or your boss. Uh, and, uh, and over time that gives them access to things like saws and, and, and needles and other uh, bits of uh, metal that uh, they make weapons from but they can also make escape tools out of. Escape tools? Literally thousands of prisoners had worked inside Dannemora's walls since it opened back in 1845. No one broke out of the max security section. These people, they grew up with dad, grandpa. Like many in Clinton Correctional, retired officer Pete Light was a legacy employee. His father worked there, and so did he. I mean, if, if you lived in Dannemora, you worked in Dannemora. 
people. They're the sons and the grandsons of corrections officers who've worked here. And so they learn ways to survive in there, working out ways that, you know, you keep the, the prison under control, you maintain security, uh, but you also sometimes give a little back. Maybe a little too much. They're off in the Belmont Stakes. June 6th, the running of the Belmont Stakes. There was supposed to be a possible Triple Crown winner, and that was going to be a fun day and it was going to be a family day. The governor did make a historic announcement that day, but not at Belmont Park. As you've heard, there was uh, two people escaped from Clinton Correctional Facility. At bed check, Richard Matt and David Sweat were not in their cells. No one had escaped from the prison proper in 100 years. At 40 feet tall and with guards manning towers, this wall is virtually unbreakable. But Richard Matt and David Sweat never tried to go through it. They weren't trying to go over it either. They were trying to go under it. This labyrinth of pipes and conduits. Governor Cuomo ordered an immediate investigation by the inspector general and surveyed the scene just hours after the breakout. You would look over the catwalk and you'd see down four or five stories of all this uh, 100 year old infrastructure with spider webs everywhere. Cutting through cells and pipes and breaking walls. I knew this was a, uh, a long term plan. It's like a fortress, a fortress inside of there, and, and, and there was no getting out without somebody helping you. Are you in love with Richard Matt? Just six days later, on June 12th, Joyce Mitchell was charged with aiding their escape. She did plenty. She uh, smuggled in or helped smuggle in the hacksaw blades. To get those weapons through the metal detector at the tailor shop, you had to have somebody that was, you know, going to do you a favor. Almost two weeks later, Gene Palmer, a veteran corrections officer whose very job it was to keep Richard Matt and David Sweat behind bars, was also arrested. According to the criminal complaint, he handed them pliers and screwdrivers. He also smuggled frozen meat past those metal detectors, claiming he didn't know it contained saws. Palmer told investigators he thought Matt and Sweat were just fixing an electrical issue on the honor block. But maybe the biggest tool he and Joyce Mitchell provided were relationships. You talk to the COs in there because they do favors for you. The remarkable part of that is not that they wanted out. A lot of these guys want out desperately. The remarkable part is that they had the cunning and the patience to slowly, bit by bit, put all the resources and the information together to make it possible. Sometime on June 6th, Richard, Matt, and David Sweat emerged from this manhole cover. They were tasting freedom for the first time in more than a decade. They were outside the wall, and nobody knew where they were heading. I mean, really, we were blind. As I say, I mean, I, I really compared it to chasing a ghost. Who State Police Superintendent Joseph D'Amico thought might come back to haunt them. I went home every day uh, with that knot in my stomach of, we got to get him because, uh, you know, somebody's going to get hurt. Gabriel DiBernardo feared that somebody might be him or his team of detectives that helped put Richard Matt behind bars. I took my weapons with an S. Yes, I put weapons on every floor. We, I secured my house. I have an alarm system. We didn't want to take any chances. Pamela Sweat was ready if her son came calling to their home in Conklin, only she was ready to discharge a different weapon. I would have knocked them out and had them guys take him to jail by themselves. Unfortunately, authorities had no such luck. The days turned into weeks. The number of tips were in the thousands. The search was costing a million dollars per day. Unconfirmed sightings in Essex and Allegheny counties turned up nothing. Responding along with a, a crew of three. I remember the frustration in the first two weeks of, uh, are they here? Are they not here? You know, are we doing enough? questioning every day. We spent a lot of time obviously searching this area. Captain John Strife and his team of DEC forest rangers played a key role in the search. They know the tough Adirondack terrain better than anybody. It can be tough just looking for, let's say, a lost hiker and trying to look for two individuals who do not want to be found. It, it was very difficult. The search radius spanned 100,000 acres. More than 1,000 law enforcement officers actually walked 10,000 of them. Sometimes being up awake for up to 40 hours straight working many sleepless nights. If search crews were getting tired of it all, the public definitely wasn't. What do you do 
punished. What, what, what's next? There's a, a very thin line between news and uh, entertainment. State University at Albany criminal justice professor Dr. Frankie Bailey studies pop culture's fascination with prisons and escapes. Most people don't know someone who's in a prison. They don't visit prisons. We're seeing the major events, the riots, the escapes, and an escape is compelling in itself. It wasn't so much my concern how they got out, but where were they once they were out. Colonel Dennis Bradford directs operations for the Corrections Emergency Response Team, or CERT, an elite squad of corrections officers called in for prison riots and escapes. These were their guys. We don't want any um, inmate that's escaped from the confines of our correction facilities out on the street, especially two murderers. Back in Dannemora, the mood there was just as unsettled. It was a rough time for these people in the woods, out of the woods. The woods, that's where they had to be, right? Where were you gonna go? How long could you stay out there on your own before you needed money, had to commit a crime? Two weeks into the search, they got their big break. We had a, uh, uh, a person go to check on a hunting camp, um, and uh, as they approached, they saw someone run away. It was deep in the woods, and we were able to recover some items that were dropped, and we sent them to our forensic lab here in Albany, and we were able to make a, uh, a solid identification. Richard, Matt, and David sweat, or at least their DNA had been spotted. They were in Franklin County, roughly 25 miles from Dannemora. Once we had a better location on individuals, we could search more efficiently. After long days and sleepless nights, authorities think they're closing in on Matt and Sweat. He approaches them and he engages them in conversation. Search crews brace for the moment they come face to face with the fugitives when outside the wall, going inside the Dannemora prison break, continues. When the DNA came back, we said, oh, solid. We have both of them here. On the weekend of June 20th, searchers think they've got their men. In the area of Owl's Head, New York, somebody broke into a seasonal hunting cabin. Forensic testing says it wasn't just one person, but two, Richard Matt and David Sweat. You get that lucky tip that kind of takes you where you need to be, and you start to build on it. But just as the clues started to cooperate, the weather did not. We were about four inches above our normal rainfall for the month of June. Not exactly ideal for a search in the Adirondacks. We had rain, uh, bugs, and everything else, but the terrain was so dense, you know, you couldn't see five feet in front of you. And you'd start to walk, and you'd hit a mountain, or you'd hit a, a marsh that was impassable, uh, or some sort of ravine. But logic dictates if it's tough on the searchers, it had to be just as hard on the escapees. Not knowing a lot about what their plans were and where they were able to uh, take shelter in that, we, uh, we did know that we were, we, we felt we must be wearing them down. But there was one variable that couldn't be ignored. You're dealing with, you know, what a psychopath is. Everybody has labeled them. This wasn't the first time Richard Matt had broken out of custody. When he was just 13, he broke out of a group home. Then in 1986, he hopped the fence at Erie County Correctional, spending four days on the lam before being recaptured. And in Mexico, where he was doing time for another killing, Matt managed to get to the roof of the prison before being shot nine times. He survived. I was very concerned. You know, my thought was we needed to get them back as fast as possible. And that possibility started to look like it could become reality. When investigators searched the hunting cabin where they found that DNA, it's what they didn't find that let them know danger could be lurking around any corner. We knew they took the 20-gauge shotgun when they, uh, when they broke into the hunting camp. No coincidence then, when on June 26, the call came in about gunshots in nearby Malone. Camper was shot and reported the area was swept. As authorities began to swarm Franklin County, investigators believe incredibly that Richard Matt spent his last few days not far away from busy State Route 30, right here in that abandoned trail. And then the phone rings and uh, they said, we think we have, we think we have Matt. For days, searchers said one of the escapees would make a mistake. Richard Matt complied. The 49-year-old, who likely celebrated his birthday just a day earlier in this trailer, was shot three times in the head by a Border Patrol agent. This time, he did not survive. I was kind of uh, very happy that none of the law enforcement officers involved 
uh, were injured because he had that 20 gauge shotgun that he took from the hunting camp and uh, it could have really been bad. It took 17 years again for justice to be served and it was finally served with a bullet and Rick Matt deserved that bullet. The book on Richard Matt was closed, but David Sweat, well his whereabouts remained a mystery. Obviously it made it, made it more difficult. Uh, I think if they were both together off of uh, you know, State Route 30, it probably would have ended right there. Authorities set up a three mile wide search radius around Malone and began slowly tightening the noose. Pamela Sweat waited by the phone. I beat John B. Um, just hoping that he would turn himself in. It was now Sunday, June 28th, here in Constable, 15 miles away from Malone and outside the search radius. Sergeant Jay Cook with New York State Police Troop B was on routine patrol. I came across a male who found um, suspicious, you know, even kind of like putting his hands up like me, like you want me. Um, and then when he realized that he was made, I think at that point he, uh, he thought, let me just get away. Until now, David Sweat has successfully evaded authorities for more than three weeks. He does not want to go back to prison. So he takes off running through this field, heading straight for that tree line. But like most things with this prison break, there's a purpose. There's a reason he wants to make it to those woods. Because just a few short miles away is the international border. And as you can see here, there is nothing stopping David Sweat from entering into Canada. The sergeant decided to uh, discharge his weapon, hitting Mr. Sweat twice in the torso. Uh, in my opinion, uh, a beautiful police procedure. There would be no Canada for David Sweat. Well, the phone rings and they said, I, we, have, uh, we have Sweat, which really uh, took a lot of weight off my shoulders. I felt, uh, I felt very good about that. One more round of applause for our partners who were all here and for the New York State Police. Thank you. The response when you gave those two press conferences, they were almost like celebratory press conferences. I remember the crowd there cheering. Well, I mean, I, you know, I try to say I'm just the coach of a winning team. That's the way I look at it. The fact that they didn't get very far in two weeks, um, that's totally lucky. I mean, if they were in, you know, somewhere in the uh, central United States, um, who would be looking for them on the ground? It was actually back at this manhole cover where authorities say they got their first big break in this case. Joyce Mitchell was allegedly the getaway driver. She gets anxious. She doesn't actually show up. She doesn't pick them up. They therefore have no plan B on the escape. Instead, Richard Matt was now dead and 35 year old David Sweat, who also celebrated his birthday on the run, was on his way to Albany Medical Center where investigators would try to get answers to some key questions. How did they manipulate this woman and get her involved and why would she go along with this? He did provide some information that fit with what the state police believe. But I wouldn't take anything, he said, uh, to the bank. Uh, so I think it's a wake-up call for everyone. I think we'll make significant changes at Danamora. Danamora is a very unique place. Um, you know, it's not just any small town, it's a prison town. If you ever did try to just really reform this place from the roots up, uh, it would be explosive. For now, there are mixed emotions in Danamora. It was big. There was a lot of community uh, uh, support. It was a tough two weeks. I saw some things that uh, I didn't really care for at the end, and uh, that's the way it goes. And in the Tarsia and Sweat households. If they would have killed him, it still wouldn't have brought Kevin back. I just want to hold him. <laughs> but just as this more than three week long ordeal ended, the final word goes to law enforcement. And to bring this to a close, not only for all the officers involved, but for the, again, the, the community members and, uh, and, and everyone in New York State and the nation. The people in these communities and all of these towns were so good to the members of law enforcement. They didn't lose patience with us uh, doing roadblocks and everything else. I couldn't thank them enough for everything they did for us. It really was a really good partnership and uh, it was a nice feeling. So far, 12 employees at Clinton Correctional have been placed on leave. Three executives, nine security personnel. There's already a new superintendent. The cases against Joyce Mitchell and Gene Palmer still pending in Clinton County. David Sweat remains in the special housing unit at Five Points Correctional Facility. On top of a life sentence, 
He now faces escape charges. I'm Solomon Syed, and thank you for watching Outside the Wall, going inside the Dannemora Prison Break.